Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we start with our signature liquidity panel with a twist of Asia Pacific. Please give a warm welcome to our moderator, Raj Sidlani, the Managing Director at Siam Capital Markets. Raj, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Is that coming through? Yeah. Yeah, I'll start uh, working. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed Sbir, the Global Head of Brokerage and Equity Group. Equity is a uh, global multi-asset uh, broker. Uh, we do uh, um, institutional B2B and we do uh, a bit of retail as well in certain regions. Uh, I'm very excited to be here in Asia. Asia has always had a, a very special place in my heart. I'm very excited to be here after this uh, stoppage for three years. And I'm very excited to be on this panel with these fine gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sam Horowitz. I'm head of FX liquidity management and distribution at CMC Markets. Uh, CMC Markets is, we pride ourselves on being probably the world's oldest fintech. And uh, we have a, a long cross asset pedigree in retail space. And in the, in the last few years, through the CMC Markets Connect brand, we have built an institutional market making business, uh, which is the, the, the piece of the world that I represent. Um, and just to echo the, the other statements. Um, it's, it's great to be back in person in Asia as well, and to see some people, meet some new people, and rekindle some old relationships, and clearly everybody feels the same about, about these face-to-face -face conferences. Hello, everyone. Uh, John Marillo, Chief Dealing Officer at Beat Brokers. We are a tech and liquidity provider. I'm delighted to be back in Asia after close to three years, I believe. <laughs> Essentially, we cater to broker-dealer community primarily. We emphasize in bespoke solutions from a tech perspective. And we're here to answer any questions down the road. Good morning, I'm Ted, co-founder and CTO of Protagant. We have been in the industry for 13 years. And uh, we have three main lines of business. First is we are licensed in Europe and Asia to provide liquidity to brokers and exchanges. A product offerings like FX, commodities, shares, indices, and crypto CFD. The second line of business that we do, we are also a technology providers. We have products like a CRM that is customized for brokers that allow them to do any sort of a commission rebates for their athletes and it pay out in real time. The third line of business that we do are enterprise blockchain solutions and we mainly focus on the DeFi related projects. Thank you. James Alexander, Chief Commercial Officer at Invas Global. Uh, we're a provider of uh, multi-asset prime services. It's nice to remain in Asia. I'm actually based in Sydney, so it's nice not to be flying 24 hours to London and suffering the jet lag. Welcome to this side of the world, gentlemen. Nice to have you with us. Okay, well, I have to say it's, um, it's really exciting to be back in Asia after so many years. Uh, we've got a very interesting panel, and I think we might as well just kick off straight, straight away and get into the nitty gritty. Discuss this, this very interesting topic, um, and so on and so forth. So, if we just want to go around the room, James, maybe you could give us a, a quick overview. You're, you're based in Australia. So the clients who interact with you out there have a different demand, uh, or are they trading the same stuff that we see across the globe, uh, wherever, Look, we, wherever we're located? Is, is that a factor in how you offer your liquidity? Yes, it definitely is. And I think the um, the short answer is that across, you know. Pan-Europe and Pan-Asia, and Pan-Asia are a much more diverse sort of, you know, geography to try and talk about in a single breath, but the trends are the same, but the timelines are different. I think, um, you know, what we've seen throughout Asia specifically is an emergence of a focus on multi-asset. Now, that's been taking place for many years across Europe. You know, wind back five, six years, I think that trend really started to take off and accelerate, and I think that the uptake of that multi-asset distribution, whether it be equities, whether it be crypto, whether it be fixed income products, these sorts of products, investment style products, these sorts of products being offered by retail brokers throughout Asia is a much newer phenomenon. It's only really been taking place in the last year or two as opposed to five or six beforehand. There's a number of reasons for that, um, but that's something that we've, we've certainly observed taking place more recently in this last sort of 12 to 18 months. And just by way of context, I think there's an interesting nuance about Asia. And if you look at the, um, I guess, on the institutional side of the business, the Bank of International Settlements does a triennial survey. And in 2019, 28% of all FX and OTC derivative flows were actually being transacted in Asia. 
Now that three-year survey is about to be released again in the next few weeks, so what will be really interesting to see is how that trend has changed, how Asia has continued to gain market share or share of volume traded or otherwise uh, against Europe and the US. Our guess is it will, but on the retail broking side, if you sort of focus more on the retail side of things, I don't think the volumes that we see you know, reported by the likes of some of the ECN venues um, and indeed some of the bridging platforms are necessarily reflective of the volumes that actually exist here in Asia because I think it's a much more dispersed infrastructure network down here. But nevertheless, the overarching trend has been that one towards multi-asset. And I think we're going to continue to see that, in my opinion. If I would jump in as well. I think the main driver of uh, you know, what assets are more in demand, what asset classes are more in demand is also volatility. It's always the major driver. And I, as a global broker that we have a lot of business in the Middle East, we have some business in Europe, and we have a lot of business in Asia as well, we see that when volatility comes on a certain instrument or on a certain asset class, usually the kind of the entire, it, it's, it's a universal move and then the volatility comes and all the, vo the volume starts to kind of increase and on something. Uh, one of the most clear examples recently is cryptos. I and mean, cryptos, the volatility comes and everyone starts trading cryptos and then it dies out. We, we've seen even through the COVID times, uh, everyone started trading US indices and gold and oil because the volatility, volatility was there. Now you look at, you see there's a, major, a lot of demand this year on euro, on cable, on the major instruments as well because of what's happening in, in Europe. Um, so I would say volatility is the main driver, but I d definitely also agree with what James said, is that there are some region-specific criteria depending on the local demand, and we see a lot of more shift in Europe or in the West towards investment-related products, uh, i.e. equities and bonds and, and futures, and while in Asia and the Middle East we see a lot of demand on speculation products. Uh, some products are more relatable as well in the Middle East. You see always demand on oils, for example, because it's a product that is you know, coming from that region. There's a lot of demand all over it, and we see always gold is in demand in Asia because it's also a, a product that is very relatable to the market. Sam, can I hand over to you? Yeah, I mean, to, to speak somewhat to Mohammed's point, actually, I, which was well made about volatility, what, I think what we see is people are looking for a volatility sweet spot. And whether that's being assessed quantitatively or even, you know, heuristically, people are looking for markets that offer volatility and therefore value for money relative to the spread they would need to cross. Um, so you get some modest amount of movement, then it's worth expressing some alpha views. If, if it's too crazy and, and therefore liquidity dries up, spreads widen out, people, people tend to view that as then not, not worth the time, even if the, you know, the actual intraday market moves are there and are substantial. So we see... We see the dysfunctional markets people step away from quite quickly, well before we're ready to, ready to withdraw liquidity. John, what are your experiences? I think, I think one of the other elements maybe we want to touch upon in, in this particular conversation, I mean, gold, gold for me, I mean, that's the demand we see naturally out of Asia. And I'm hoping everyone here agrees with that, that, that regardless of volatility, Gold is always featuring as a number one or number two product for, for many brokers. Is that what, and also, sorry, secondly, is it not the case that the regulator, depending on where you are based, also helps one decide and helps influence or has an influence on what products you can offer and what, what products are in demand? Well, our company having a global presence uh, and have a global reach, shall we say, uh, we've seen I, I must and I, I share your views, Mohammed, particularly. There's a great deal of interest on gold G5s out of Asia, but there's also a new trend. I, I wouldn't say new, but uh, it has become a key product for most of our clients is the CFD offering on cryptos. Crypto has had a very, uh, I would say, tremendous impact on a lot of brokers in this region. And the reason for that is a lot of people got involved at an early stage. We've seen the volatility. We've seen these significant moves. I'll call it big swings. And uh, that brought a lot of business to a lot of broker dealers. One particular statistic, though, that I came across before this panel, uh, as we were analyzing data, BTC remains a very appealing product for brokers in this region, along with Ripple or XRP. That's where we see a lot of volumes going through. So over the course of time, of course, there is that up and down. Uh, volumes when volatility go up are very much aligned and correlated 
volatility goes down, there's not a much trading activity within. But it's an area um, that most of our clients are heavily focused on because it allows them to have that multi-asset offering. And this is a key component in the brokerage world in this part of the business from our point of view. Thank you, John. Ted. Yeah, so regarding the asset class, I see over here is uh, I split into three re different regions. For the EU, what I see, uh, there's a higher trading demand in the shares and indices. And moving, moving forward towards uh, Middle East, it is gold, gold and oil in this, these two asset class. And in Asia, uh, I will categorize into three different asset class that affects major metals, and crypto CFD. So the traders have been like tra trading among these, these three asset class uh, during this period. And just now uh, we were talking about how, how regulations ha have uh, impact the, the behavior of the traders and, and, the, and the volume. So in EU, EU region, um, how the regulator have impact the, the whole behavior of the traders is that ever since EU regulator have a lower the leverage, uh, we see that uh, the FX and meta volume from there it start to decrease. And we have an increase in, in shares and indices during that period. And for the cultural, cultural as well, uh, impact that also affect the interest of the, of the traders in, in Middle East, it seems like gold, gold and oil has been always the, the top interest that they have, they have been looking to in tradings into. And as for, as for Asia, Asia crypto CFD for us have been, have been very a great interest in, in, terms, in terms of a, a Bitcoin or the, I, I would say, I would say it will be, if you look into the coin market cap, top trade, top 20 traded product, these are the product that the, the traders are looking into when you talk about crypto CFD. So there seems to be always in Asia trader, they seem to be always looking for new exciting products, uh, find, finding new opportunities. That's why I was sharing that the top, top most trade, 20 traded product in coin market cap. These are the constantly product that we are always adding into, into the platform for the brokers to, to take liquidity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, sorry, James. Can I just throw one more yeah, sure. footnote go, to that? Go for it. Um, it's a bit of a specific one, but looking at the regulatory overlay and how that has really impacted demand for certain asset classes in Asia, if you look specifically at Japan, a market where the regulator applies different license types to various asset classes, FX, securities, commodities are separate license types. I think what that has served to do is perpetuate the focus traditionally on FX as the primary asset class in Tokyo. Obviously the demand is there regardless. But I think that regulatory overlay has probably delayed the shift to multi-asset, as has already taken place in Europe over the previous three, four, five years. What we see now is Asia, in part due to what I sort of anecdotally uh, attribute to significant compression in dollar-yen yields. Brokers are struggling to monetize dollar-yen, which is a key, key instrument in the Japanese market. That has forced the hand of a number of the brokers, particularly the larger brokers, into adopting multi-asset even if belatedly compared to some of their European counterparts. But what we're now seeing is that uptake is occurring in rapid fashion. And it's that that, for us strategically, we think is going to be a real driver of the Asian growth story over the next five years. Because if you think about the capacity of this market to expand into multi-asset given the FX base, it's enormous. And whether that's crypto, whether that's indices, whether that's bonds, futures, single stocks, there is a a populace that is very comfortable with leverage trading. And really, to be very honest, you know, the economic environment that prevails now is going to speak to more of a multi-asset need and a demand. So I think the regulatory environment has possibly played a bigger role in you know, determining those pockets of demand previously, but I think that's going to diminish going forward. That's, yeah, that, that's, an, that's an interesting take. Um, interestingly, as I think Sam might have a view on this, so I'm gonna throw this one to you, Sam. No one has mentioned NDF liquidity, and I think, you know, certainly I've been out in Asia the last two weeks, I've been in Singapore, Jakarta, you know, these are countries where they don't have spot contracts, as it were, but I'd like to get some sort of, sorry, I'd like to get some sort of feeling whether NDFs are playing any part in the liquidity offering to your brokerage clients out, out, in, out, out, in, out in the East, because 
we're getting it from the West. So we're getting inquiries from clients who are based in, in Europe who want to trade NDFs on emerging markets, for example. So where are we on that? And Sam, particularly, I think with your background, uh, classic sell side FX guy, you've probably got a, a good handle on, uh, not that everyone else doesn't, but uh, I think you know, you're fresh out of that side of the world, I think. So it'd be interesting to hear what you think about demand for NDF liquidity in the Far East. Well, um, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's no doubt at, at the top, you know, the upper end of the food chain that that demand is real and has been present for a very long time. Where I think it will be interesting in the next couple of years is, is to what extent that demand trickles down through into true retail, for example. The thing is, with, with NDFs, the dichotomy of whether you are truly providing liquidity and absorbing risk transfer or you're merely redistributing becomes a lot more pronounced. There are only five or six people who really take down risk in, in most of those currencies. And therefore, the impact of, of redistributing what is at the top a very quite limited amount of risk appetite is, is more pronounced. In euro dollar, everybody has a price. It's probably coming from somewhere else. The, the market impact of absorbing isn't, isn't huge. Even outside the, most three, you know, the three most immediately traded NDFs, if, if you go and look at Malaysia or Indonesia, Market, you know, the, the required amount of volume to move the market is really quite small still. There's not yet a true uh, giant killing primarily lit market at the top of the food chain. EBS can claim to be close. The 24 exchange guys can claim to be close. But kind of everybody in the wholesale world thought we'd be here by now with that becoming much more lit, market data becoming more readily available. And therefore, you know, unfortunately, that also means spread, spread compression inevitably comes. But I think the next couple of years, that is what people will want to see increasingly, is full spectrum in FX. And, and I agree Latin America as well, by the way. Yeah. Um, Mahab, I was going to ask you, because yeah, I mean, in Dubai, in, surely Indian rupee. Or, exactly. You know, there, there, there is exactly. the market, but is it, it's CFD, right? At the it's end of it's the a CFD, but there is, I mean, in Dubai, there is a, there's a huge demand on, on Indian NDFs and... Uh, in Dubai, we've been uh, a member of the, what's called the DGCX, which is the Dubai Golden Commodity Exchange, which offers these type of products and a lot of the, a few, maybe not a lot of the Asian as well, Asian NDFs. We've always seen demand is very high, but it's honestly, it's just a talk because uh, when you actually offer that, we have been offering these uh, instruments for more than four or five years now, and we haven't seen like uh, any serious volumes on it. Plus, you know, there's a lot of teething issues, you know, connecting to the exchanges. And it's not similar when you're talking about exchanges in Europe or in the U.S. Everything is kind of clear. The liquidity is there. The market participants are there. Uh, NDFs is, is not much. So I, I would say I think recently we have kind of removed some of these instruments because there's just not enough demand on it and the kind of the maintenance of it. And uh, it just wasn't worth the, the trouble. Um, I would say maybe in Asia there will be more demand. I think with, in the future there will be as well, there's going to be more joiners to these markets. And when there's enough liquidity and when bigger exchanges might adopt these NDFs, then I think it will be more a, a suitable instrument to offer to everybody. John, what, what about your client base? Are they accessing NDFs in any shape or form through you? Are you sourcing that? How do you source it if you need it? Well, as part of our diversification in, in you know, product offering, we have looked into providing NDFs, but it's a constant challenge where to outsource that liquidity. Nevertheless, the volumes or the interest from our clients is not there. It's bare to minimum. Ted, any comments on NDFs from you? For the NDF, we don't see much uh, demand over here, but because I'm kind of like in the blockchain crypto industry, <laughs> only NFT, <laughs> I see a, a demand. During, the, during that period. <laughs> it's not the only thing I can, I can say uh, for NFT to relate back to the topic over here is that NFT traders actually, investor, they, they get their trading or investment journey started off from, from NFT or any other crypto in, type of investment and they start exploring effects of a traditional product. That, that is where we see the, the liquidity or volume coming in from this different segment of traders. Yep. James? That was a great pivot. <laughs> um, I think that fundamentally we view uh, NDFs in one way. Until there is an efficient clearing solution, I don't think it's going to become a material product for our customer base. I don't see the margins that the prime brokers that we face into ourselves, even if heavily subsidised, becoming a commercial reality for the type of clients that we're serving. 
in the near future. Now, if that changes, if there is a PB or a, you know, a number of PBs that decide they're going to become more aggressive in the, the clearing of, of NDFs, whether that be, you know, under the cleared derivative rules or the uncleared derivatives rules going forward, uh, I think that until that is addressed more efficiently, I don't see demand taking off. That's just our view. Okay, so I think I'm concluding here that if you're servicing a retail broker community or a broker community, NDF liquidity is, is maybe not that relevant, but perhaps Sam, institutional space like true hedge fund, buy side, real money traders, surely there's demand in, in NDFs in, well, this, the, in this region. 100% there's demand and there's already, tra uh, there's already abundant trading activity going on. The, I mean, the buy side, the real money buy side have to participate because they will have benchmarks they need to comply with and that will force them to have exposure to certain markets. With the buy side, the, traditionally the, the biggest barrier to trading usually isn't execution because they, they have big trading teams. They understand the execution paradigm pretty well and they have a reasonably good handle on transaction cost expectations. Usually it's fear. It's, it's fear of any sudden regulatory changes in the markets that they're participating in. I mean, I remember being involved on the buy side years ago when the Bank of Thailand abruptly decided to change all of the rules for investments in, in cash instruments as well. And we had to exit pretty much all of our exposure in, in four days at a very large top tier real money manager. And we were the only game in town for about four or five days. And it was frightening. It was, it was almost impossible to clear the amount of inventory we had in, in cash instruments there and in, and in our currency hedges. So that's what drives people's fear. But the, the mechanics of NDFs, they're not, it's not rocket science. They are a tradable instrument. They do resemble CFDs in, in the trading mechanics of the product. There are some nuanced complexities around the settlement process and the fixing process. But, you know, compared to running, for example, a, you know, a Gen 2 exotic options book, it's, no, it's nothing like the same order of complexity. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to throw you all a curveball question, which we didn't agree pre this meeting, but it's just to come through as we've been talking about liquidity. And I wonder to what extent we're seeing resurging demand now for the ruble and the ruble pairs. I mean, clearly, most of the market was risk off when it came to uh, the invasion, and that the invasion is now six, seven months hence. Are you guys, is anyone seeing a demand in this region for ruble, ruble trading at all? Or are you actively telling clients they can't get access to ruble? What, what, what's, what's, what's the view on ruble liquidity at the moment? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure about ruble liquidity. I mean, we've had, especially in Dubai and the Middle East, there is a bit of demand on it, especially when the war started. But now it kind of faded out. But I would say there's a lot of demand uh, from China on ruble. And there's a lot of demand from Russian clients on Chinese yuan. And uh, I'm sure there's a, it has something to do with you know, the bilateral trade agreements that they have together. But we've seen increasingly high demand from Russian clients. Because we do have an Armenian entity that deals mainly with CIS countries. And, and, uh, and there's a massive demand on Chinese uh, yuan liquidity from that side of the world. Sam? Are you a market maker in ruble at the moment? Uh, not currently, no. I, I've, I think we're, what we're also seeing is we're not seeing much expectation from clients that it's going to be viable anytime soon. And this is, and it kind of speaks to what I said before about the, the volatility and liquidity sweet spot. I don't think we're in it in any, in any shape at the moment for the ruble. Fair enough. John, your... I, I share your views on this. Uh, there's... <laughs> this is a dull question. <laughs> uh, essentially... No. Uh, okay. We have some clients asking randomly, but it's more of a curiosity rather than anything else. It's not because they have a meaningful interest into trading. At least this is up to now. Thank you. Is that the same for you guys, James? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Any I ruble? Share the same view. Uh, no much demand, but uh, Chinese yen, there's some increase of demand on, on yen, like what Muhammad shared. Three out of four of my PBs won't clear it, so the answer's no from us. We just don't see the demand. I mean, here in Asia, I think we're shielded from that inherent demand from the local geographies anyway, but when the three out of your four PBs are saying, no thanks, no interest. What, what we did see out of interest is when we had the similar situations in Turkey, we saw Turkey demand for the lira return much more quickly. The expectation that anything Erdogan can do is a temporary hiccup, even though, you know, He's, he's clearly got some serious issues to contend with, and it's quite structurally unsound, that market. Every, every time we get these dislocations in Turkey, within a week, people are asking us again. 
Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I can go with James as well. I mean, we, if you can't get a PB to clear the product, it's going to be quite, quite, quite problematic to offer it. I want to move just slightly away from liquidity in and of itself and talk about connectivity and the role that connectivity plays within the liquidity game. And, and, and by that, I mean, where, where are you guys? Are you pricing Asian clients out of Asia? Are they latency sensitive? Is there a requirement to be having having matching local you know local matching engines? Are your retail brokers happy with a LD4 or MY4 connect connection, or do they want Tokyo? And that's coming on to my next question, which will which are, which will be coming after after your answers to that. So I mean, how about how about you, Mohammed? I, I I definitely think that um, being able to source local liquidity and being able to connect locally at the in the region is is very important. Uh, we do have LD4, NY4, and TY3 servers, and, and, and now we're just about to kind of also onboard in Singapore. There's a, there's a lot of latency, there's a lot of high-frequency high trading, and, uh, and that especially for coming from Asia. I mean, the liquidity provisions in Europe, especially on LD4, is always better because you can get access to all of the LPs here. It's, a, it's kind of, um, you know, the, the market has been, it has advanced um, in, in Europe more, but I think now we see Singapore is becoming a new hub. There's a lot of uh, LPs coming to not to mention Japan. I'm sure James will have a, a lot of points about Japan as well, but we believe in that you have have to be in the same air in the same place to connect we have to have the latest and because this is the competition recently now the spreads the the pricing is becoming similar everywhere now the competition becomes on the very small aspects of the business that's why like a, a few milliseconds of latency an improvement in execution goes a long mile with with the retail brokers Sam do you want to Strangely, to to that? strangely for somebody who spent most of his time in bank market making, I'm not a fan of a race to the bottom for, for low latency trading. Doesn't mean it's not something you have to address, but if that last two millis is going to make all the difference between positive you know, alpha on the flow and not, then to me that speaks to an inability to talk to the customers about what it is they're really doing. We will be putting an engine in SG1 most likely. We're in LD4 at the moment. What for me is interesting, I think, as, as this is a regional focus panel, is... TY, the, the Tokyo-Singapore debate, um, maybe leaving Hong Kong out of this because I think they've, they've kind of got a lot of problems at the moment, but SG1 is, is where all the traction seems to be gaining for people co-locating. You've stolen my next question, but anyway, go for it. I'm go sorry. For it. sorry. And what Tokyo do about this, I think, as, to speak to the point earlier about it being an FX hub, I think Tokyo is at risk is, in terms of its status as any kind of a meaningful FX player. I think EB, EBS making some decisions on what they're doing with, with regional matching there. Given that they're, they're no longer the preeminent primary venue that they were, that decision still, I think, could have quite far-reaching consequences for Tokyo. And, and Singapore are not messing about with the, you know, the deals they're offering. Yeah, look, I think you know, we've certainly floated with the idea of an SG engine. We've had Tokyo for a number of years, obviously, uh, LD New York. For me, it's not so much that last two millies of which you speak. It's, it's about making sure that your customer base in the local area have a, an excellent trading experience, an execution experience that speaks to the quality that they expect. And expectations are very, very high in the region, make no exception. They are probably higher in terms of execution quality expectations than Europe, despite not having best X as an overarching regulatory umbrella. So for us, it's, it's about having a TY matching engine. It's also about being smart about how you route other uh, sort of flows. You know, if you're taking pricing from the CME, if you're creating you know, original index pricing, why would you route CME to London before routing it to Asia? You don't. You route straight from New York to Tokyo. Now, you can't beat physics. Physics is there. You're always going to have that gap between New York and Tokyo and London and Tokyo. It's going to be there. But everything else, you can control. You can control your execution experience, where you field your clients, where you match your clients, how much is actually passed back to your source of pricing or your source of hedging. There is still a hell of a lot that really needs to be optimized well if you're going to have success with some of the biggest names in the region. And if that's the target, then that, I think, is the ask. Now, on the SG thing, we've been very close to it for a long time. We still don't see the demand side there. I think the supply is there. I think LPs have connected. Um, the MAS has done a great job of subsidizing, getting interest in that, uh, that, that hub, that center. And I think the LPs have responded well. I think there is good liquidity available in Singapore. I just don't think there is the demand at this stage. That might change, but that's how we see it. I think certainly I would echo I would echo that. I mean, on on this trip, I have you know we've met with Euronext, we've met with all the major players, and I think there's, they're really doing a good job in promoting 
uh, SG1 as, as the future, as it were. But I, I don't think we've reached the inflection point. I think it's still a little bit chicken and egg. But I think we're concluding here that it's inevitable that Singapore will will take market share. Does that mean t TY3 becomes irrelevant? Does it die? Does it go away? Or is it what's going to happen with TY3? Can we have two matching engines, one in Singapore and one in Tokyo? Is that is that a good thing? I believe that uh, Japan is a, is, a, is a it's uh, like it's a, it's the, its own monster. You know, you can never take Japan out of the equation. Uh, Japanese clients are enough to have more than just kind of like one liquidity hub. So uh, I, I don't think TY3 is going to die out. I think Japan is go always going to be independent. It's going to have its own liquidity, its own clients, and its own philosophy when it comes to trading. But, but James, you definitely would know better than this. I can speculate. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to predict the future by any means. It's, it's not my place. It's not my area of expertise. I don't think there is necessarily a significant downside in having multiple hubs in Asia. As a matter of fact, I think you know, the prominence of multiple hubs in Asia might actually incentivize more of the New York and, and European based primes and liquidity providers to drop organic and native matching engines in this part of the world. And if you're routing from Tokyo to Singapore or Singapore to Tokyo, guess what? It's still a much shorter distance than trying to cross the Atlantic or the Pacific. So either way, I think it's a win for Asia. I think SG being strong, TY being strong is a win for Asia. And if it encourages more names down here, then that's fantastic. I think for us, what it really is about is, you know, to your original question, Raj, about networking, you know, focusing on that network efficiency for Asia. Not just saying, look, we're a European-based provider, we provide pricing out of Europe. You can, and look, you know, Euronext, um, Eurex, this is still huge products for our customers. You know, European equities, US equities. We're routing instruments from all around the world. We have to be focused on network. The question is, how much do you do yourself? How much do you leave to external vendors? How much do you leave to your liquidity providers and PBs that you're actually using for your hedge venues as well? You know, is, is your PB's backbone network going to be stronger than that of your technology provider? Maybe it is. So maybe your point of insertion into the network is actually not the point of your ultimate hedge. You're just trying to get close to your PB's pop, wherever that is in the world, depending on the exchange. And I think there's a lot of toing and froing as to the best and optimal setup for that. We certainly spend a heck of a lot of time and effort on that space. OK, th thank you, James. I'm conscious of time. We're coming up to the five minute mark. But maybe, Sam, have you got a quick eye of, of view on TY3 SGSG1 one, and one, where we're we going with that? And then maybe one, we can have a question or two from the audience. One thing did occur to me to speak to your point about customer experience. Customer experience is they view what's going on in our trading stacks as a black box, effectively. And it's, it's a sum of all of our capabilities in every part of the chain. So you can spend all of your time optimizing the, 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 the immediate part of liquidity sourcing in TY3 and SG1 or wherever it is. If there's something in the middle of all of that, whether it's a credit engine hop or something else that's, that's sticking another 30 millis on for no reason, you can, or you can undo all your own good work. So just, just optimizing that one part won't guarantee the customer experience that we all want for our customers. It's, it, it has to be a holistic look at your whole stack, whether that's the bits you own in-house, the bits you outsource to vendors, and, and being pretty scientific about where, where the pain points are. Yeah, completely agree with that. And I think there are hidden pain points, you know, the credit checks, the margin checks. These are things that you have to align. And it's the alignment, the optimal alignment for your customer base across those regions. It's the really, it's the nuance. And there's no silver bullet. It's just the best balance for the flow that you're trying to attract and focus on. And Raj, just one small thing I want to add before you go move on. We said uh, one of the things that we've discussed is the fragmentation of the market and uh, the fragmentation of liquidity. And we see in Asia there is, it's not like Europe where you have passporting, you have kind of common liquidity, common regulation. In Asia, I see it as three different segments. You have China and Hong Kong, then you have Singapore and Southeast Asia, and then you have Japan standing alone. So I think it's the fragmentation of the market uh, kind of allows to have more than, more than, more than just one. Uh, liquidity center and, and well okay well let's well, should we found should we finish on fragmentation I mean let's let's go first to Sam because Sam's has, has got a slightly different business model to to, to us we, we are broadly speaking in the liquidity redistribution and reselling the space ISAM capital markets we're sort of higher halfway in between reseller and origination but Sam you're, yeah I'm not going to give I'm not giving you the floor and give you the floodlight but I think we haven't discussed the role of, of, a, of a CMC within what we do here and, and you know be just just a couple of minutes on being a true risk transfer sort of you know organization well i mean for us we think that that is in general a, an important part of what we do and an important part of our usp is that we're a principal risk maker you know price maker and risk manager and there's only one way in my opinion to do that and that is is to make it very very data driven in terms of what that brings to the market the difference for me between liquidity uh, provision 
and liquidity distribution is huge. And, it, and it's simply the ability to absorb risk transfer. And you know, in, in some very well uh, lit markets in medium sized amounts, it, does, it, it doesn't always make a huge difference. But once you start to get to positions where you're either in something that's slightly less liquid or where market conditions are less favorable, that's when that becomes a, a really important point, that you're not going to transmit all of the market impact from, from your clients down, downstream. Um, and so the ability to absorb that is, is key for us. And we've come at that point from a different standpoint to where banks would typically arrive at it. We've started with a big retail book, which lends itself very nicely to internalization. And therefore, we have a, you know enormous cross-asset data sets going back years and years to, to actually you do our R&D on, but also... Internalization is the, is the standpoint that we started from, whereas most medium-sized banks, they build out from pricing tough customers that are low-hanging fruit in the, in the aggregated ECNs, getting their fingers burnt, not internalizing as much as they like to because it's all hugely toxic, and then, and then not developing the data analytics underneath it to screw that part. We're starting with internalization, and they're now building that out to our in, institutional customers. Thank you. Um, Ted, any yep. last plugging in, for cryptos? Yeah, in, in terms of fragmentation and just now we talk about connectivity, I see a big uh, technology gap over here in crypto CFD because uh, um, a lot of brokers, when they are getting liquidity for crypto CFD, they tend to pull it from different sources. They try to get it from crypto exchanges, prime of prime, prime of prime of prime, or sometimes maybe they're just getting feed from another broker. Now, in this case, um, the, the fragmentation, what we are talking about over here, I can relate it to the, the price difference of the similar product that we are looking at. And for crypto CFD, it's pretty common that uh, you can see, if you, if you monitor carefully, that uh, price, similar product price may be moving in a different level. In this case, and when, when brokers tend to pull from different sources, degree sources, the price is moving at different level when, when the, on the technology side, when the primary feed fail, fail over to the secondary feed, there's going to be a gap, gap down. And then after that, when the first uh, primary feed comes out, it, it, will, it will get back up. And this creates a very bad uh, experience for the brokers and for the traders. So in terms of the technology sites, I think it's, it's very important that uh, because we've been spending a lot of time and effort and investment into creating this uh, aggregated solution to make sure that the price balance out when uh, this, this liquidity is being, is being pushed up for crypto CFD. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Okay, I think we, this is a wrap, guys. Um, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, thank you for everyone for coming and thanks to the organizers and everyone that's made this event uh, a pretty spectacular bit of fun out in the Far East after three years of, of desert, shall we say. Thank you very much. <laughs>